In an earlier video, we introduced the concept of military slaves. Slave armies existed throughout the Islamic world from the 9th to the 19th century. As we have seen, these slave soldiers could become very powerful, even determining the rise and downfall of caliphs. In one case, that of the Mamluk Empire, the entire military elite, including the Sultan, had a slave background. So how can a slave become a Sultan? Let's take one step back to examine how the privileged status of Mamluks came about. Slaves were brought from different regions during the Abbasid Caliphate, but it were the Turkic slave soldiers from Central Asia and later on the Caucasus who acquired a dominant position in society. We will thus focus here on the Turkish Mamluks. In an attempt to build a strong, specialized and loyal army, Muslim rulers turned to slaves. Young boys from a privileged background, some were from royal descent, were bought as slaves. Typically, they were around 12 years old. They had to be non-Muslim and usually they had already obtained some initial military training. Arriving at their master's court, they would first receive an Islamic education. Even if they did not necessarily lead pious lives later on, stressing how they were led from darkness into light was believed to enhance their feeling of gratitude towards their patron. A thorough military training, including fighting on horseback, then formed the core of their education. The relation that the Mamluks built up with their patron and peers during their education is best described in terms of a family bond. It was believed that investing in this bond at an early age was crucial in creating a loyal nobility. A novice Mamluk and his patron related to each other like father and son. Mamluks spoke Turkish together, which added to their feeling of solidarity. They also tended to marry concubines brought in as slaves from the same region that they had come from. Thus, the entire military elite operated in Turkish, despite the fact that they served an Arabic-speaking empire. Their high-level training and privileged status and the cultivation of their Turkish identity made them devoted soldiers that could be used effectively even against local Muslim populations. But it was exactly this arrogant distance that also created problems with the locals and their patrons. The valuable slave soldiers demanded more and more privileges in the form of money and political power. In 847, the caliph in Baghdad al-Mutawakkil was killed by his Mamluks, after which chaos ensued with different caliphs succeeding each other as military and other factions promoted their candidates and almost destroyed the caliphate. In Egypt, Mamluk soldiers took power in a similar coup, however with a very different outcome. Dissatisfied with their ineffective and corrupt ruler, Mamluks placed one of their own officers on the throne, marrying him to the wife of the killed sultan, Shajarit ad dur the concubine that we read about earlier on in this module. Revolutionary as it was, the system of Mamluk one-generation rulership that hereby came into operation created one of the most successful empires in terms of military dominance, economic boom, and cultural flourishing. Starting from 1250, the Mamluk Sultanate ruled for almost 300 years over the area that is now Syria and Egypt and extending into the Hejaz to include control over Mecca and Medina. Only those bought as slaves could join the ruling elite, and the whole system was catered to create an isolated nobility that was replaced after each generation. Children of Mamluks were in principle excluded from rulership, which regularly caused tension. But regardless of time and place, history teaches us that empires and civilizations always show a pattern of conjuncture where a period of rise is eventually followed by a period of decline. And this pattern held true for the Mamluk Sultanate as well. 
It is difficult to point at one reason for the Sultanate's downfall, but some problems that plagued the Mamluk system in Baghdad played a role here as well. The main concerns of the Mamluk Sultans were the Crusaders and the advancing Mongols. While forming an existential threat, the enemy forces also jeopardized trade. Trade routes were the veins of the Mamluk Empire. Cairo owed much of its wealth to international luxury trade, and a steady supply of slaves sustained the Mamluk system. There were internal problems as well. The third Mamluk, Sultan Qalawun, appointed his son on the throne as successor, thus moving away from the one-generation nobility ideal. Not surprisingly, some Mamluk emirs felt that they had a more legitimate claim to the throne and murdered the new sultan. The tension between hereditary rule and the Mamluk system continued to be an issue. Stemming from a pagan and slave background, the legitimacy of the Mamluk ruler might not always have been so obvious to his Muslim subjects. That is why Mamluk rulers took great trouble to present themselves as the defenders of Islam. This was done by celebrating their military victories against the enemies of Orthodox Islam, the Crusaders, and bringing a halt to the Mongol advance. Another way of boosting their legitimacy was by sponsoring pious activities through the construction of mosques and other religious buildings. Some of this Mamluk heritage, with clear Turkic influence, can still be admired in Cairo. The costs of maintaining the Mamluk system were enormous. The elite slaves were expensive in acquisition, and the training and upkeep were costly as well. The battles and program of public works also put a strain on the treasury. As in Baghdad, the decision was taken to give Mamluks the use of fruct of agricultural land through tax farming in lieu of direct salary payments. This offered only short-term relief, while the long-term effects were disastrous. Without a fiscal income, the state had no money to pay for the basic infrastructure, like roads and waterworks further adding to the negative spiral of decline. The plague, which wiped out nearly one-third of Egypt's population and the resulting instability in society, did not help either. The final blow came from an unexpected corner. European ships advanced to such an extent that they could sail around the Cape appeared in the Indian Ocean where Mamluk traders had held a monopoly on the Indian spice trade. The Mamluks asked the rising political power, the Ottomans, for help, only to invite a takeover by the upcoming Turkish dynasty. This meant the end of one of the greatest empires of its time.